Good morning. It is Sunday morning, the 15th of September 2024. <laughs> I am continuing reading Dennis Kelsley's account. Uh, it's chapter 6. Uh, this is Many Lifetimes. Uh, the chapter is entitled Reincarnation and Psychotherapy. Both Joan Marshall Grant and Dennis Kelsey were therapists, hypnotherapists, but, but very different methods. And this is an account of their cases. Uh, Joan passed away in 1989, and uh, I am really enjoying reading about the their insight into reincarnation and psychotherapy and so on. We continue here uh, the second reading by Dennis. A question which I'm often asked is whether every patient who is able to reach a deep state of hypnosis can be regressed to an earlier lifetime. In the majority of patients with whom, for one reason or another, I have used hypnosis, the need to explore an earlier lifetime has not arisen. And among those in whom I thought a previous personality might be relevant, only a small proportion have been able to recall a single episode. Even when a patient is intellectually convinced of the concept of reincarnation and only seeks empirical evidence of personal continuity, I cannot always help him to gain it. For instance, I had a patient who was so eager to have a glimpse of some episode in her long history so that she could speak about the concept with more authority that she devoted 12 sessions to this project, although the problem for which she had originally consulted me had already been resolved. I've had, an ex I've had an ample evidence that she was an excellent hypnotic subject, so when she said that her failure must be due to her inability to be hypnotized, I told her to hold her left arm out at a right angle, and then suggested that she would forget about her arm until I told her to take it down. I brought her out of hypnosis and Joan suggested that she might like to stay to tea. For an hour she sat happily chatting, oblivious of the fact that her arm was still extended. Only when I told her to put it down did she realize what she had been doing. Needless to say, I should not have performed this elementary experiment unless I had known that it would not cause her even momentary discomfort. One might have thought that her eagerness for personal proof would have caused her imagination to produce some more or less inconvincing fantasy, especially as she had read all Joan's books and had felt, as we did, even at our first meeting, that we were old friends. Certainly, she is a woman of outstanding integrity, but contrary to my expectations, I have found that nearly every patient has shown the same determination not to fake. Considering the prevalence of claims to far memory, which, had, which to me seemed obviously spurious, I find it interesting that even when a patient has recovered an episode which appears essentially plausible, although in fact it has become grossly distorted in transit to his present consciousness, it is often he who first questions its validity. It is widely held that patients tend to produce the type of material which will please their psychiatrists. But mine have seldom done so, presumably because their desire to be relieved of their symptoms was more important to them than the time-wasting ploy of trying to lead their therapist astray. It is also probable that Joan's presence at a session acts as a deterrent to patients who might otherwise employ their imaginations in an attempt to delude or impress. Although there are occasions, for instance, if she is in pain or very tired, when her faculties are temporarily inactive. Under normal conditions, she can tune in to the episode which the patient is reliving, especially if the episode concerns a split-off fragment of one of his earlier personalities. She explained to me that the reason she finds it so easy to share the patient's identification with his ghost is not merely that she has not considerable experience of coping with this type of phenomenon, but because a ghost, by its very nature, has so often repeated the circumstances in which its energy is bound, that the emotion is deeply etched, the situation clearly delineated, the background specific. I have found that it is very unusual for a patient 
to remember the name he bore in an earlier lifetime, or to be able to date an episode which he has been able to relive in most graphic detail. This may be due to the fact that the incidents which may, my patients have recalled under hypnosis were directly concerned with the origin of their symptoms and therefore are not memories which stemmed from integrated components of their personality, but from the ghost which had become split off by some traumatic event. A ghost exists in a circumscribed present, present which contains emotions and sensations, but no knowledge of matters which are prim primarily intellectual. For instance, the girl dying of hemorrhage would have thought of herself as I, not by name, and the date of the abortion would not have been associated with her pain and terror. Joan was able to date this girl's death and therefore to know that there was an interval of less than two years before she incarnated in a male body, only because the clothes which played such an important part in her fantasies were in the fashion of 1927, a fact which Joan happened to remember because it was the year she bought her trussel. Trussel. One of the few occasions when a patient produced a date which was of intrinsic interest occurred in 1959. I can best describe him as a stalwart yeoman. Following an accident in which he wrenched his shoulder very severely, he had developed a disability in his right hand, which was clearly not due to any organic cause. He was referred to me in the hope that hypnotherapy might help where a more orthodox psychiatric approach had failed. Except for his disability, he was in excellent physical health and mentally an exceptionally well-balanced man. He had left school at the age of 13 so as to be able to contribute to the support of his family, and so far as I was able to discover, his historical knowledge was virtually non-existent. His recreations were gardening, carpentry and swimming. He seldom went to the cinema, but neither an or a radio nor a television, had neither a radio nor a television and was not interested in books. He entered the hypnosis very easily, and he had been recounting some episode from his boyhood when he paused and then said, I'm 17 and I'm very ill, but not so ill as some of the other sailors. As this current history had contained no mention of a severe illness or that he had ever been to sea, I asked, when did this happen? He replied without hesitation, in 1567. While I was still assimilating the fact that my patient was now in the reign of Elizabeth I instead of Elizabeth II, he proceeded to describe his symptoms, the bleeding gums and loosening teeth, the sinking, stinking breath, the bruises which appeared without any blow to cause them, and the increasing weakness. He described, in fact, a typical case of scurvy. After he had recounted many vivid, many vivid scenes of his experiences while an Elizabethan seaman, I asked him whether his ship had fought against the Armada. He seemed puzzled and then replied, I do not know what you mean by the Armada. But when during the next session I asked, when did you die? He answered, in, 19, in 1595, five years after we sank the accused, the accursed Spaniards. My memory for dates is exceedingly hazy so I had to wait until I got home to confirm that the Spanish Armada was defeated in 1588, five years prior to the date he had given for his own death. The reason he was puzzled when I first asked him about the Armada was, I felt sure, that he was regressed then to a period of his Elizabethan life which antedated this event by several years. Obviously he could not remember a sea battle which, from that point of view, had not yet happened. When a patient is assisted by hypnosis to release the energy which has become trapped in a fragment of a previous personality, he may either have an intense apreaction or else, while still attaining a therapeutic degree of identification, he may remain sufficiently detached to be both spectator and participant of the crucial event. I'm not able to predict with any confidence which of these two courses a patient is likely to follow, nor if he encounters more than one ghost during his treatment, that his reaction will be consistent. 
I presume, therefore, that the immediate impact of a recall depends on the energy content of the ghost and not on the qualities of the present personality. The recall of an event which occurred centuries ago can be as vivid as the memory of an automobile accident which occurred last week. In fact, more vivid, for one is insulated by the intervening clock time from a memory and normal waking consciousness, but a regression can have a sense of immediacy which is enveloping, enveloping and absolute. I gained empirical evidence of the intensity of such a recall on the first occasion that I relived an episode from my own long history. I was very doubtful of being able to recover anything, especially as hypnotists are notoriously difficult to hypnotize, and Joan had has no experience, has no expertise in this particular technique. I advised her to follow the procedure which she had seen me use with patients, but instead she lit a candle and told me to stare at the flame. She averred that this was a method of inducing a level shift that had once been a commonplace to us both, and which I might again find effective. Although rather nettled that she was ignoring my advice, I fixed my gaze on the flame and gave myself suggestions of relaxation. The transition of a sceptical psychiatrist lying on his own couch to a man racing a chariot was instantaneous. On my left there was a barrier surrounding an island of spectators in the centre of the arena. On my right a chariot was overtaking me. I knew I should give way to it, but instead I forced my pair into the narrowing gap. There was a shuddering impact as our wheels interlocked. I was catapulted forward and felt a wheel run over my chest. As the chariot overturned, it swung the horses against the barrier. The last thing I remembered was their screaming. At this point, Joan brought me back to the present. But the terrible realization that through a desire to show off, I had caused the destruction of a pair of beloved horses brought a degree of shame which in my current life I had never previously experienced. There was no possibility of disassociating myself from this event. That it had occurred 2,000 years ago was entirely irrelevant. It was I who had done it and it was happening now. For 48 hours I felt I would never be able to face myself again. Some months later the thread of my debt to horses reappeared when Joan, for other reasons entirely, was recalling episodes from a life we had shared, also as husband and wife, in England at the end of the 18th century. Among the many details which emerged was that my life centred round horses. I bred them and schooled them and sometimes gave one to a trusted friend, but I never sold any, which is probably why our house became increasingly dilapidated. So anxious was I never to cause them discomfort that I forbade steel to be put in their mouths and always rode them on a bit made of leather. My attempt to redress the equine balance must have persisted into my present life. Riding was my favourite hobby and a horse I schooled during my period in the army only just missed being selected for a British Olympic show jumping team. But though I enjoyed show jumping, hunting and the occasional point to point, I was a poor competitor because I could never bring myself to take an avoidable risk of injuring the horse. Joan of course knew of my interest in horses, but what she did not know, because it had never occurred to me to tell her, was that I found the idea of putting steel in their mouth so distasteful that whenever possible I used a bit made of rubber. I stopped this here and I continued soon.